you for your son. Thank you for what you've done. Your love is so amazing. started getting for ready for Christmas the earliest this season. Who thinks they were they were the earliest? I'm talking September. Who started getting ready for Christmas in September? No? October? 
Do I have any October? For real, October? What? How early in October? Before Halloween. Let's give it up for Maria Gonzalez, y'all. Getting ready for Christmas early. That's true Christmas spirit. Unfortunately, I don't have a prize for doing such a thing, but just, you know, you beat all of us. All right, without further ado, the girls and Frank. No, no, no. no, no Frank, okay. <laughs> stars are brightly shining it is the night of our dear Savior's birth long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul You think it's funny? I don't think it's funny. Oh, come on.
Thank you. Good morning. Make sure I'm on here. I'm on on this end. Christmas. What an awesome time of year. I remember Christmas used to be real special to me. I know you're thinking, what do you mean used to be real special? Well, the rest of the year I was just doing what I wanted to do. Was the farthest thing from a Christian that you could possibly be. And then when I became a Christian, it was like Christmas every day. So it's not a special time of year anymore as much as it used to be because it's just I'm mindful of Christ all year now, not just on one time of the year. I noticed during those songs, your kids did an awesome job. Incredible. It's amazing the hours of hard work that goes into practicing that for it to be done that quickly, too. Uh, I noticed the uh, nursery school was a little thin. I I have a deal for you. Either you go out and find some young people who have young kids and bring them in, or I'm going to start praying and some of you guys are going to start getting pregnant. (laughs) But we we will grow our children, our, our nursery I have faith for that. Just look at Alexa. If you think you're too old, I sit in the back going, that's a little little girl and she's mine. What am I doing with a five-year-old at my age? But thank you, Jesus. She's are above, abundantly above and beyond what I was able to think or imagine. When we thought we were done, God said, no, I have more for you. So it was a blessing to our life. And um, brings us so much joy. You know, there's several topics as Christians that we need to kind of think about, pray about, talk about uh, on a pretty regular basis. One of them is, is just salvation in general. You know, I, I never get tired of thinking and appreciating how awesome it is that I'm forgiven. I never get tired of thinking the the awesome price that was paid for me to be forgiven. I never stop being as thankful as I could possibly be for that. The Bible says those who are forgiven much are thankful much. So I am very, very, very thankful. One of the other things we need to keep thinking about on a regular basis is knowing our Father. Just knowing who he is and learning about his love and how much he loves us. Really understanding about forgiveness and why he can forgive us and what it took for him to forgive us. It's kind of along the same lines. But one of the things that need to be on our list that we really look at that that really is going to impact our life, excuse me, is the love walk. That's a message that needs to be preached several times a year. And uh, something we need to examine ourselves, take inventory, go before the Lord and say, all right, God, how am I doing? Is there anything that needs to change? You know, as we look at the story of the first Christmas, what we see is, and we talked about it in uh, the men's group on Saturday morning, and um, if you missed that, boy, I'll tell you, it's, it's some very interesting stuff that comes from that, but one of the things that we looked at was when the, the first Christmas The first Christmas service when Jesus was born, people came not to get, but to give. The wise men came with gifts. They weren't coming to see what can I get out of this deal. And that should be our attitude in our heart as we come to church. That's the sign of a mature Christian. Uh, Giving is one of the primary and probably on top of the, the list of signs and, and, and expressions of love is, is giving, not feelings. I can give to somebody and be kind to someone and not really have any feelings for them. So giving is really, you know, the Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave. He gave us the first Christmas gift. He gave us his son. He gave us his best. He gave us, giving your child is even way above and beyond than giving your own life. 
I'd rather much give my life than my child's life. So he demonstrated his love in giving us his son. In light of Christmas, we look at the command that Jesus said as he died and he rose and, and he told us, this is my commandment, that you love one another. It's not a suggestion. It's not when we feel like it. It is a commandment as much as thou shalt not kill or any one of the other ones. It's not the ten suggestions. It's the ten commandments. And this one, the Bible says, fulfills all of them. Because if I love somebody, I'm not going to kill them. I'm not going to steal from them. I'm not going to covet his wife. I'm not going to... I will... If I love somebody, this fulfills the heart of the law. As I said in, in Romans 5.8, it said that God demonstrated his own love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Well, there's two things I see in that scripture. When somebody demonstrates something to you, they're showing you how to do it. It's a demonstration. Look, watch me. I'll show you how to do it. And then they, they show you. He demonstrated what love is by loving us while we were sinners. That's the second phrase in there when I read that one day. And I thought about the love walk and I thought about how I'm supposed to love people. I thought, how did God love me? Did he wait for me to get right? Did he wait, <coughs> excuse me, did he wait for me to be good? He loved me in my condition the way I was. No questions asked, no conditions. He loved me just the way I was. And the Bible says it's that love and his kindness that leads you to repentance. It's that love that is supposed to cause us to change. Not the fear of punishment, not the fear of, of being rejected by God, but just knowing and understanding that overwhelming love that he has for us is supposed to draw us to him. And the Bible tells us as we are loving people with that same kind of love, he said, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. As we love people with that same type of love, it's supposed to draw them to Christ. Because then it goes on to say, if you have love for one for another like this, then people will know that you're my disciples. So the question I want to ask today in light of Christmas and in light of the greatest gift ever given, which was Christ himself, what is a reasonable response to that gift? What's a reasonable course of action when you think about someone giving their son for you? And we need to really understand that there's nothing we could ever do to earn that. There's nothing we could ever do that we could say, okay, now he died, but you know, I, I earned it and I deserve that. There's nothing we could ever do. But when you think about the price that was paid, we have to ask, what is a reasonable response to that? And, and part of the answer to that is, what understanding do you have of the love that he had and how much value you put on that love is, will determine the response and how far and how much you respond. As we looked at the fact that Jesus was in heaven and he was God and he came down in the flesh, he laid aside his deity, and, and he, for the first time, you know, he came to earth, he was left his place of honor and everything else to take on the form of sinful flesh. That would have been enough to say, that he became and he experienced sin and was tempted in every point as we are, as the Bible says. Then he was beaten. He was accused falsely. Do you realize if he did, and the Bible says he did not respond, he didn't open his mouth. Do you realize that if Jesus, when he was being accused, first of all, he could have called on all the angels and ended it. He could have spoke up for himself. Guess what would have happened if he spoke up for himself? He would have been acquitted. They would have found him not guilty. And then he wouldn't have died and I would have went to hell. So he had to keep his mouth shut for my sake. The Bible says for the joy that was set before him. We are the joy that was set before him. That's why he took the beat and that's why he allowed them to pull out his beard. And that's why he held back the angels from stepping in, from stopping that process. Because that is the price that was paid for my salvation. That was the price that was paid for me to be able to even talk to my Father in heaven. That was the price that was paid for him to be able to have an intimate relationship with me. So in the light of this gift, 
What's a reasonable response? Not only did he die and forgive our sins, he also put into place where even today, tomorrow, the rest of my life, if I ever blow it, there's a way that I can go and even have those sins washed because I can go to him any day and say, Father, forgive me. He removed all of the sins and accusations that were against me that hindered me from having a relationship with him. He took them, nailed them to the cross, and paid for them. So now I have clear access to my daddy in heaven. How do we honor this? What is a reasonable response to this? Is to have the relationship that he sent his son to die that you can have. That, that's really a reasonable response. That if he loved you enough to die for you, to forgive your sins, so you can have a relationship, making time to have that relationship is really a very reasonable response. The other thing we can do in, in light of this gift is, is to develop the love walk and to walk in the command of love. That's a very reasonable response for somebody who's given everything he has for you. As we look at this love walk, I want to take a situation. It's one thing to tell people they need to walk in love, and it's another thing to show them how to do it. You know, in light of Christian, Christmas, there's a lot of questions that come up. One of them being about a Christmas tree. That we shouldn't have a Christmas tree because it was used for idol worship. Uh, some people think that we shouldn't exchange gifts. That we shouldn't celebrate any holidays. So I'm going to read a couple of scriptures. And in light of these scriptures is why I believe we do certain things. In, in 1 Corinthians 10.25 it says this. I'll give you a second to turn there. Can I have that water please? Throw it, throw it, throw it. Thank you. First Corinthians 10.25. It says, eat, <clears throat> eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. If any of those who do not believe invite you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, asking no questions for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this was offered to an idol, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you, and for conscience' sake, for the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Conscious, I say, not your own, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? I can give you the answer to that question. It's the love walk. That's why we don't do certain things that the Bible says clearly we have liberty to do. So if I can eat food offered to an idol, then I can have a tree that someone used for idol worship. And I have no problem with that. I mean, there is no idols. He's saying they're praying to gods that aren't in fact gods. So the fact that there are no idols, that tree don't bother me. And, and if they did use it for idol worship. According to this, the Bible says, I have liberty. It wouldn't bother me because I don't believe there's idols. Let me read another one for you. Romans 14, 23. The Bible says all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. The Bible says that everything that we do should be in light of the love walk and how it affects others above ourself. Romans 14, 23 says this. If you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something, you are sinning if you go ahead and eat it. For you are not following your conscience and your convictions. If you do anything you believe is not right, you are sinning. The Bible says whatever is not done in faith is sin. And this translation says if you do anything you believe is not right, you are sinning. So that tree could be sin for one person and not for another. If there's something about that tree that bothers you, or you having a tree in your house that inside of you says, I don't like having a tree that, you know, at one point somebody might have used for idol worship and to worship the, the God of light, and, and I just don't, then you shouldn't do it. But you shouldn't judge the guy who has one either. It's interesting, in, in light of these scriptures, let me read one more, then I'll, I'll share that. Galatians 5.13. 
It says, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in this one word, even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Now, now think about this. We're arguing over things. And if we put it in perspective in light of who God is and the knowledge that God has and the holiness that he is compared to who we are, I heard Keith Moore say this and it just made so much sense. First of all, the Bible says this, that now we only know in part. We don't have the whole picture. Right now, we don't, no one's doctrine is 100% correct. No one. So for us to be arguing and, and discarding this command to love over doctrine that we're not clear on is, really does not make sense. Amen. The love walk is so much higher than having your doctrine correct that if you're fighting over a tree because you disagree with someone or you stop going to a church or you won't go to someone's house or you won't talk to someone over something, or you backbite or talk about somebody and what they believe, and you're, you're violating the love walk, which is the highest command above all else. We're, we're call, and it says if you do this, eventually you're going to be devouring yourself. If you're not walking in love to others, you're, you're harming yourself. One of the things we need to, you know, Keith Moore said this, I started to tell you, it's like, he says it's like a, a, a two-year-old drawing with a crayon and going, look what I did, and what would we say to our child? Oh, that's wonderful. Then when we would say, well, maybe you could stay in the lines next time, you know? Compared to who God is and what he knows, he's never impressed by our knowledge. He'll never say, wow, I never thought of that. Can you explain it to me? God will never say that. Compared to his knowledge, we know nothing. So to ever fight over a disagreement on what you believe really is makes no sense at all. We're supposed to love one another. One of the things, more so even now, first of all, I, I grew up in a church with the most loving pastor that you will ever meet. The love walk was, and boy, he had it down. Like I've never seen in anybody's life. And I've known a lot of men of God, a lot of famous people on TV. I've gotten a chance to talk to him. I haven't been around him that much, so I can't say, but I was around Pastor John for 18 years, and he had the love walk down. So that was instilled in me, first of all. But there's something that happens when you become a pastor. There's something that happens the way you feel and treat and think and perceive people. You really do have the heart of God as a shepherd you look at people, all people, as your own children. And, and grace and mercy and second chances and third chances. You know, sometimes I, I, I talk with people and they're pointing out somebody else's fault. It just reminds me as my own kids when they were younger, tattletaling on the other kids. And, and it's amazing how one child will want another child to be spanked. <laughs> Spank them. Yeah, Jacqueline, it's you. <laughs> she needs more spankings. But Jacqueline was a very, very unique and strange individual because she actually asked for spankings for herself. Yes, you heard me right. I need more spankings. Those words came out of her mouth. So that's why she is the girl she is today, because we did not spare the rod. She's not spoiled. <clears throat> one, one other thing we could do, and I'm going to start to try to wrap up soon. This will be my first closing early. <clears throat> the first thing we got to do, one of the things we could do in, in light of this love is to really share it with others. How can you have such an off, awesome gift and not want to tell other people about it? One of the things we need to realize as we do this, and, and it really was pretty interesting as I started to think about this. You realize not everybody's going to be thrilled when you tell them how much God loves them. I used to think 
that if people just knew God, how much God loved them, they would love him back. This is, this is not true. The Bible says my people destroyed for a lack of knowledge. I just figured if they just knew, then they would love God. If they could see what I see, they would love God. The next part of that verse says this, because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being my priest. In other words, there's people who understand and comprehend, and you tell them about the love of God, but they literally make a decision and saying, you know, this thing I have in my life, I know how much God loves me, but I'm not willing to give this up for God. So in other words, I'm rejecting him, and I'm rejecting the knowledge of his love. Even though you explained it very clearly, and I understand it, I'm not willing to lay this down, or I'm not willing to change my life to walk in light of what he's asking me to do, so I'm rejecting that love. It actually goes further and tells us, when Jesus said this, in light of, first of all, you're not going to love anybody more perfectly than Jesus did. And he said these words, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. So there's certain people, you can be perfect, you can love them perfectly, and they're still going to hate you. So that tells me that people have different responses to this love of God. All the way from hate to a complete and total surrender to it. So you have to ask yourself, where am I in this line? Have, have I surrendered 30%, 60%, 100%? Where am I in response? What's a reasonable response to this love? I mean, that's the question I want to leave with you today for Christmas. Have I, have I really responded to this love with a point where I was willing to lay my life down for others the way he loved, laid down his life for me? In order to love people with this kind of love, the first thing you have to do is understand God's love and be loved by him. And you have to walk in that love and experience that love. And you have to love him and be loved by him. And out of that relationship is where this love, that's the real thing, flows towards other people. Amen. It's out of that relationship that you have patience for people. It's where you have mercy. It's, it's in light of the mercy you received from your father for the mistakes you made where mercies developed towards other people. It's amazing how quickly, how easily, first of all, people can go and ask for forgiveness and receive it and say, I'm forgiven. And then second of all, how quickly they forget when somebody else needs that same forgiveness and they're harsh on them. They're so easy on themselves, but they want to be, you know, letter of the law with somebody else. One thing I do know is that I am imperfect. Again, in light of God's holiness and where I am, I'm light years apart. So how can I judge somebody? I've put it this way. If holiness was 100, I mean... Some of us are maybe on a five, while some of us are on a one, but really in light of where we need to be, we're all very short. So how can I pick on somebody who's at level one when I'm only on level five in light of Jesus Christ, who's 100? We all need a whole lot of mercy. Amen. We all need a whole lot of grace and a whole lot of the redemptive blood to redeem us and, and the justification that, that fills that gap. So in light of that, I have to love other and others and be patient with them and give them as many chances as they possibly could need. I have to lay my, put my foot down when I see somebody hurting somebody else. When I see someone being mean-spirited. When I see somebody taking advantage of people. And it's really interesting because I have to develop this, but I usually go from one end to the other. I go from being really nice and really loving and really kind so when I see something like that going, oh yeah, watch what I do now. So there's really no kind of middle ground for me. Either you're a loving person with faults or, or you're a mean person that just needs to be dealt, dealt with. And when I get to that point, I, I deal with people. And, and usually I got to tone it down when I get to that point. But thank God we don't have many of those people. I genuinely believe that people that are coming to church are coming because they want to be made better. They're here for a reason. The Bible says the healthy don't need a doctor, but the sick do. 
Maybe when I arrive, which I never will, then I can start judging people. But I'm never going to arrive while I'm here on this earth. I'm going to need mercy. I'm going to need forgiveness, just like everyone else. And, and I have to ask you to grant me the same patience and forgiveness that I grant you when you come and say I messed up. Especially in the area of my cell phone. Just give me some grace. <laughs> Listen. I would love to talk on the phone with everybody all day long. I really would. That would be a lot of fun. But sometimes I forget to charge my phone. Sometimes I leave it home. And then there's other times, like the other day, my, my nephew had a, a baby girl, and there was a group chat. And I got probably in that group tra trap chat. <laughs> I probably got like 75 texts cause, or, or uh, alerts because each message alerts me twice for some reason. If somebody could figure out how to shut that off of my phone, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> Along with that, everybody was chatting, another group chat with, with Christina. She's on the watching by video. Hi, Christina. We love you. You're healed in the name of Jesus. And, and they were going back and forth. So every one of their alerts rang twice on my phone. So I'm working, and my phone is like a pinball machine. Da -da -ding, da -da -ding, da -da -ding, da so I can't keep going to check it. And my boss was trying to get me, and he got really upset because I ignored him too because I just goes. <laughs> so just little grace. I'm teaching about the love walk. You need to not put everybody... You know, if you get four texts a day, I always answer my texts. Every one of them, I answer them right away. Well, just know what other people might be going through before you judge them. That's what the love walk does. Amen? So in light of Christmas, the relationship that God so desired for us and with us that he paid such an awesome price, I challenge you to make sure to examine yourself and say, am I really walking in the fullness of that relationship? That relationship with God is what keeps, it's the heartbeat of Christianity. Amen. Everything else flows from that. Making time for your daddy in heaven. Amen? Amen? God bless you. Have a wonderful Christmas. We're going to, what's coming first? The song of the presence. We have, we have presents for everyone. Brother Maui had it laid on his heart that he wanted to, to bless the whole church with gifts. So I'm going to turn it over to Holly as, right, Holly, you taking that or? or? Darcy. Darcy. Same thing. <laughs> Faithful women in the church. They're all the same. Okay, they could handle that. But before I sit down, I just want to tell you how much I love you and appreciate you and, and just take this time when the Christmas day to... Remember why you were really celebrating what we're celebrating.